Thank you so much for joining us. We are super glad that you could join us today. Hey, please let us know if we can pray for you. We are a church that loves to pray for people. So let us know. Send us um, your send us an email or let us know on any of our social media handles, and we'll pray for you. But right now, it's time for the word. It's time for the sermon. This is church on Valentine's Day. How cool is that? Everything is red. The pastor is almost red. This is my best effort to wear something. This is the, the reddest thing that I have in my closet, okay? And my shoes are, are red, but the people on camera cannot see my shoes, and I'm not going to stretch so much. But um, uh, it is amazing to have church on Valentine's Day. Also, it is super awkward to have church on Valentine's Day. I don't, I don't know if you understand how awkward it is to be a pastor when Valentine's Day falls on a Sunday. It's super awkward because uh, people are waiting to hear what the pastor has to say about Valentine's Day. Especially in Goa. Like, does he support it? Does he condemn it? Right? And depending on what the pastor says about Valentine's Day, you're going to be able to tell me whether I'm a man of God or a man of the world. Right? People are waiting because the Christian world is so divided on Valentine's Day. Right? Um, half of the Christian world absolutely loves Valentine's Day. Uh, the other half absolutely hates Valentine's Day. There are some people who believe Valentine's Day is from the devil. I'm serious. There are some people, if you give a rose on Valentine's Day, they'll tell you you're doing the devil's work. Right? Someone actually told me that. We, we put up a post last year uh, on our Instagram page. It was a scripture, okay? I think it was uh, love one another uh, as I have loved you. And there was a rose. And someone sent me long comments about how bad it is to mention the word Valentine's Day. And then it went from bad to demonic, right? And then they started sending me video links about how we should not support Valentine's Day. Hey, please don't send me video links, okay? I, I know everything there is about Valentine's Day. I'm not here to judge Valentine's Day. I'm here to preach about Jesus Christ. That's my job, all right? But, um, but that's one part of the Christian world. Another part absolutely loves this day. Right? This is your one chance. There are some people who have been waiting for an entire year. There are some people who went through lockdown waiting. Like their hope was Valentine's Day 2021. Like, Lord, uh, don't give me coronavirus. Keep me alive till Valentine's Day 2021. Because this is your one chance to tell the girl that you love, the guy that you love, that you love them. Right? There are some people, I think, in this room. And um, uh, look, let me, uh, let me give you a heads up. Okay? Um, this is for all the guys in the house, for all the men. Let me give you a heads up. If you've come to church today with a rose, right, and you're hiding that rose somewhere, and you're going to give that rose to that girl who does not know that you're going to give her a rose, here's a, here's a heads up. Girls at Limitless Church are very hard to impress. Okay, really hard. Like, I have seen so many innocent, poor little hearts being broken over the last two and a half, three years, right? Like, poor guys, like, all they wanted was love. And you girls just broke their hearts. I mean, a terrible thing to do. And the, the worst thing, you know what's the worst thing about that? Is that I have to counsel these poor, heartbroken guys. I have to clean up your mess, okay? You break their hearts and I have to do the counseling. And I'm terrible in counseling broken-hearted guys. I'm terrible. Like, my, the best advice that I come up with for broken-hearted guys is, is, bro, don't worry, there are many other fish in the sea. That's the best advice, right? And it's, it's such a terrible advice. No, no, no. It's a terrible advice because then they, they get their hopes up, right? They get all pumped up. They come back again and ask someone else out. And then I have to counsel them again. And that's the that's vicious circle again and again. So please, before giving that rose, think about your pastor and how hard he works in counseling people, okay? Think about that. Yeah, yeah, uh, it might be a good idea to just hold on to that rose, okay? Just keep it, take it back home. Don't put it in your pocket, all right? Because roses have thorns, and you know, that's, uh, yeah, we don't want that on Valentine's Day. That's going to be a pretty bad Valentine's Day memory. I can't counsel you out of that, that thorn. 
But Valentine's Day is such a controversial day, right? Um, such a controversial day. So I thought, you know what? Let us make it even more controversial. Let me add to the controversies. So I've decided to title my sermon uh, in a, with a little controversial title, with a little controversial topic, right? So this is what I'm calling my sermon today. Check this out. I'm calling it Lover. That's the title of my sermon, Lover. And please don't turn to your neighbor and say that, okay? I know I, I tell you that every week, but not today. Please don't do that. We don't want slaps in church. But um, because lover is not a very good term to use today, right? Um, I don't know if you know this, but in today's day, in today's popular culture, lover is a very bad term, right? Some years back, back in the day, lover would be a term that you call people who love you, right? Or, or someone who you love. You call your boyfriend, your girlfriend, lover. But, but today, lover is used to call someone who you have a secret affair with. Okay, lover is used to, to call someone who you're cheating your wife or your husband with. All right? Lover is a term used to describe a mistress. Even worse, lover is a term used to describe a prostitute today in today's culture, okay? So please don't call your boyfriend or girlfriend lover. It doesn't mean uh, it's not a good term, all right? It's not a good term. So then why am I calling the sermon lover? Why call this holy sermon where I'm preaching the holy word of God with such a, a, such a scandalous title? Why do that? I'll tell you. I'll tell you in a bit, okay? Don't judge me yet. Wait till the middle portion of this sermon and, and you'll know, right? But right now I want to ask this question. Right now I want to open with this question. Why is Valentine's Day so popular? Why is Valentine's Day so huge? Why is the whole world uh, so crazy about Valentine's Day? Like who made it so big? Why do you think? Why is Valentine's Day? Who made Valentine's Day so big? Yeah, businesses. Yeah, yeah, it's true. A lot of people believe it's marketing and advertising. And it's partly true. I mean, companies use Valentine's Day to sell their products, right? I just got a message saying Cupid, uh, from Cupid. Cupid sent me a message. Uh, and Cupid is not something cute, okay? But um, companies use marketing, advertising, use Valentine's Day to sell their products. Check this fact out. Um, on this day, just on this one day last year, Valentine's Day, Feb 14, 2020, People in America spend $27 billion on this one day. Not million, billion with a B on this one day. And this is only in America, right? Leaving the rest of the world out. Check this other fact. On this one day, every year on Valentine's Day, six million people buy rings for their loved ones. Six million I'm talking about six million rings. Some of those are diamond rings. Some of them are gold rings, right? Why spend so much? Why? Are we so good in advertising and marketing? Is it really about advertising and marketing? Maybe a bit is true. Maybe a bit of credit goes to advertising and marketing. But I believe it's something else. I believe... There's a need deep down in the human soul, and every human being has this. Every human being on the planet, go to any country, any race, any, any nationality, any people group, uh, any religion, every person has a need on the inside of you. This need is a need deep down in the human soul, and this need is a need to love and be loved. Yeah. Love and be loved, and every human being has this need. Love and be loved. You have this need inside of you. And love is something that cannot be kept on the inside of you, right? Love is something that cannot be stored. Love is something that just is not felt. Love has to be expressed. 
Love has to look like something. Love is not love if it does not look like something. Right? So that's why sometimes love looks like a gift. Sometimes love looks like a rose. Sometimes love looks like a ring. Sometimes love looks like a card. Sometimes love looks like a box of chocolate. Right? Sometimes love looks like helping someone who cannot help themselves. Sometimes love looks like driving 30 kilometers every Monday, right, Sarah? Every Monday to tribal people, to be with people who are forgotten by society, to be with outcasts, singing songs for them, playing music for them, cooking food for them, giving them clothes, making them feel loved. Sometimes love looks like making the unloved feel loved. Sometimes love looks like spending time with the old. Sometimes love looks like giving up something for someone, right? Love looks like something. That's why we do stupid things sometimes. That's why we do crazy things. Sometimes we do dangerous things. Sometimes we do beautiful things. And what we're really trying to do in doing all these things is we're trying to express love. Expressing love. Showing love, demonstrating love is a sign that you are a human being. And you're not an angel fallen from heaven. You're a human being. Let me say this. Expressing love is a sign that you're a human being created in the image and likeness of the greatest expressor of love the world has ever seen. Demonstrating love is a sign that you're created in the image and likeness of the greatest demonstrator of love the world has ever seen. And that is Almighty God. We are, we are so similar to God. Have you realized that? What we're really trying to do in all of this, in, in, there's something on the inside of us that we want to express. What we're really trying to do is what God has been always doing. And there's no better person in expressing love than God. No one comes close, okay? No romantic comes close to expressing love uh, like God does. Not even Shah Rukh Khan. Yeah, I'm sorry if you're a Shah Rukh Khan fan. I, I don't love, like him so much. Yeah, I can tolerate him. But even Shah Rukh Khan, with all that he does, does not come close to the expression of love that God how God expresses. Amen? God so loves you. God so loves you. All the popular love stories that you know. What are some love stories that you know? Come on, throw. Romeo and Juliet, beautiful love story. Um, what is the other one? Taj Mahal? Taj and Mahal, this is a love story. Taj Mahal story. All right, who is that? Uh, 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 huh? Shah Jahan and, and Mumtaz. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, not Taj and Mahal, okay? Or did you say Raj and... Raj and Simran. You remember that? Beautiful love stories. Beautiful love stories. But none of them come close to the greatest love story of them all. Because all these love stories are between two people who love each other, right? All the famous global love stories that movies are made with uh, or made of are between two people who love each other. But the greatest love story of them all is between a God who loves you when you hated him. The greatest love story of them all is of the creator loving his creation who does not love him back. And because love has to look like something, this is how God expressed love. Check this out. The greatest expression of love one could ever see. Romans 5.8. But God showed his great love. He showed, he displayed, he demonstrated, he expressed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. While... We were still sinners. I mean, think about it. God sacrificed his only son for you when you hated him, when you did not love him back. 
I mean, I have a daughter, okay? She's my only child. And there's no way I can even imagine sacrificing her, not even for the best person on the planet. And God sacrificed his only son for the worst people on the planet. That has to be the greatest love story of all time. God and you is the greatest love story you can ever find. You think it's true? Let's give Jesus some praise. Come on, let's give God some praise. But today I want to talk about another love story. Okay, it's Valentine's Day, right? And I know I'm not a romantic. I know I'm not Shah Rukh Khan. I don't like romantic movies. I'm not good at this love thing, okay? But I'll try my best in preaching um, the way this love story deserves to be preached. It's a love story from the Bible. But it's a very, it's not a very famous love story. It's hidden somewhere in the Old Testament. Not a lot of people have read it. Not a lot of people know about it. And not a lot of people preach on this story. And I think the reason is because it's not a very decent story, right? And we Christians, we love decent sermons in church, right? We love things that are decent. If it's not decent, then you get so angry and you, you, you hate people, you hate churches, and you call them um, something else. But I'm going to preach about it. It's in the Bible, I'm going to preach about it, right? You ready for an indecent love story? Three people in the room, everyone else is like, all right, if you brought your Bible, open your Bibles to Hosea chapter 1. Hosea chapter 1. Some of you guys thought I'm going to the Song of Songs, right? Some of you, I saw your faces. Like, they're like, oh no, he's going to talk about, no, no way. So uncool. No, Hosea chapter 1, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read from verse 2. You ready? No way, you didn't find Hosea. Come on, you guys, look up on the screen if you couldn't find Hosea that quick. Hosea 1, uh, 2, and 3. This is what it says. When the Lord first began speaking to Israel through Hosea, he said to him, Go and marry a prostitute. Go and marry a prostitute. I told you this is not a very decent story. So that some of her children will be conceived in prostitution. This will illustrate how Israel has acted like a prostitute by turning against the Lord and worshipping other gods. So Hosea married Gomer. Say Gomer. Say that one more time. Gomer. You need to learn this name really well. Okay, Gomer. Say Gomer out loud. Gomer. Gomer. And she became pregnant and gave Hosea a son. Let me, let me pause here. Let me give you the background of this story. All right? this is, I told you it's not a very decent story. It's going to become even more uh, indecent as we go by. All right? But here's the background. Hosea was a prophet, which means he was pretty high up, pretty respected in society, in Israel. Kings would go to Hosea for, for wisdom. Wise people would go to him for wisdom because back in the day, there would be one prophet in an entire country all right? Today we have many prophetic voices, right? But there would be one prophet in one lifetime that God would speak through. And Hosea was this guy in Israel. He was the main guy. Very prominent figure, very respected figure, man of God, holy, holy, holy man of God. And God tells him to go and marry a prostitute. God is telling a prophet to marry a prostitute. Imagine the awkwardness in this story, right? Because Hosea, guess what? Hosea has to go to a brothel to find this prostitute, right? This is a holy man of God, probably never seen a brothel in his life. He's probably never seen a prostitute in his life. He does not know how to, how to do the talking. He's so awkward in this moment. He's probably walking to the, to, the, to the brothel with his eyes covered, with his face covered, thinking to himself, what if someone sees me there? What will they think, right? Because you can't tell them that God told you to go to a brothel, right? I mean, imagine if, if you're caught at a brothel, you can't use that as, hey, God told me to come here. No one is going to believe you, right? 
So imagine the awkwardness. Uh, Hosea is in this brothel and he's asking for this girl, Gomer. And Gomer shows up and all the other people, all the prostitutes and pimps in the brothel are looking at him. And they're like, he's the, he's the prophet guy, right? He comes on TV. Man, what is he doing here? These guys are terrible. Their lives are terrible, so messed up. And Gomer comes, and she's probably thinking he wants to buy her for the night. And Hosea, this prophet, this man of God, goes to Gomer, this prostitute, and he's so awkward, right? Imagine the awkwardness. He's like, hey, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm Hosea. My name is Hosea. You probably know me, right? I come on, on, on TV. Um, but hey, this is the thing, okay? Don't freak out. This is the thing. But um, um, God told me to ask you whether you'll marry me. Like, God told me to ask you. So, hey, uh, will you marry me? Will you marry me? Right? I don't have a ring. I'm sorry. I didn't get, get you a ring. I don't know how to do this. I'm a prophet, right? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I think I have to go on one knee. But hey, uh, super awkward right now. Never done this in my life. But uh, will you marry me? Oops, will you marry me? Imagine the awkwardness, right? Imagine the awkwardness uh, that Gomer faced. I mean, she, she's probably looking at that and she's stunned, right? She's like, okay, guys, is this a joke? Come on, is this, is this, is this for real? Is this April Fool's Day? And everyone else is like, no, no, it's Valentine's Day. Oh, okay, so it might be, it might be, it might be genuine. Uh, are you sure? Are you, are you sure? Because you, you know what I do, right? I'm a, I'm a prostitute. You're a prophet. You know what? This is what I do. Are you sure? And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, God told me. So, so she's like, uh, okay. All right. Yes. I guess so. Yes. Right. And all the prostitutes and pimps are like, wow, yeah, woo. You know, that sound that you all just made. So good. Such a nice story, right? Such a beautiful, beautiful Valentine's Day story, right? A prophet marrying a prostitute rescues her from prostitution, gives her a brand new life, a respected life, right? Beautiful, beautiful story. Um, cutting the story short, uh, they get married, they have three kids, uh, beautiful kids, I think. Uh, all kids are beautiful, right? But um, two boys and a girl looks like such a happy, happy marriage, such a beautiful Valentine's story. What do you guys think? Isn't this beautiful? Yeah. But this is not the, the love story. This is not the love story. This is just the first part of the story. This is the, the part where the intermission starts, okay? This is the part where you grab your cop, popcorn and, and come back, your drinks and come back. Now it's the second half. Don't, don't, don't leave, I'm just saying. This is the second half. This is where the story turns. It, it, have, you, have you been to movies? You know, after the intermission, you, you go back very happy, you know, because the intro is nice. You come back and you, you see a completely different story, right? It's about to change right now. Check this out. This is the twist in the tale. Hey, hope you're enjoying the word. In the meanwhile, let me quickly explain to you how you can give to support our church and ministry. We've made it easy for you to give today. You can give via Google Pay or via bank transfer. The details of that are on your screen. We also want to say thank you for continuing to support us with your prayers and with your giving. But right now, let's get back to the word. One day, Hosea comes home and finds out Gomer is not home. She's not in the house. The kids are there. Everything is there, but she's not there. He goes around asking all the neighbors, hey, have you seen Gomer? And then one uncle in the neighborhood, this uncle who's always by the window, right? Always wants to know. Every neighborhood has this uncle, right? This uncle comes to Hosea and tells him, hey, um, Hosea, uh, I think Gomer has gone to the brothel. She's gone to the brothel. And I think she's moved there. Because I saw her with a bag, with a luggage bag, and I think she's, sorry, man, but I think she's moved back 
to the brothel. Shockingly, Gomer leaves this high position in society, this beautiful marriage, leaves her three own children that she gave birth to, leaves her husband, right? Her, her, her respected husband, her loving husband, who married a prostitute when she was a prostitute, rescued her from that life, gave her a beautiful life. She leaves all of that. She had everything a girl would want and she leaves all of that, goes back to becoming a prostitute. She leaves the position where she's getting respect from people to selling herself to the scum of society. She does that. Let me ask you a question. Honest answers, okay? Honest answers. If you were Hosea, if you were in the place of Hosea, what would you do? What would you feel? What would you think? What would be the emotions and feelings inside of you? You would feel hurt, feel angry, right? Angry. You'd feel brokenhearted, betrayed. You'd feel really, really hurt, really broken. You'd also feel embarrassed, right? So embarrassed because you're this, everybody knows you in town. You're this prominent figure. You're this authoritative figure. News channels follow you. Arnab Goswami is outside your house every day with a camera to see what you're doing, right? The whole nation is going to know. This is going to be national news, right? That your wife, the wife of the prophet, leaves him and becomes a prostitute. Everyone will know this. Your friends will come to you and say, I told you, didn't I tell you? Don't marry her, man. Don't marry her. Who marries a prostitute, right? So embarrassing, so, so embarrassing. But here's the problem. Here's the problem with reading this story. Most of us, when we read this story, we think and we feel what Hosea felt. We put ourselves subconsciously, okay, this happens every time you watch a movie, any movie, even a Shah Rukh Khan movie, you put yourself in the movie. Right? Subconsciously. That's why you cry sometimes. That's why you feel the pain, feel the emotions, because you're subconsciously putting yourself in the, in the story. That's what happens with us all the time. And when we read this story, subconsciously, we put ourselves in Hosea's place. We feel what he felt. We think what he, he thought about. Right? And that's the problem. Because we read this story, and even when we preach this story, we give that narrative. So we read this story, we hear sermons on this story, and we go out judging every gomer around us. We judge every gomer in our lives, every gomer in church. Every person that has done something bad, that has betrayed someone, looks like a gomer to you. That's the problem. The problem is context. And that's not the context. You are not Hosea in this story. You are Gomer in this story. You are Gomer. This is your story. You came here today. I don't know who invited you, but you came here. You're sitting here, and I've just opened the book of your life. This is your story, and this is my story. You and I are the Gomer in this story. That's why I've titled the sermon Lover, because you and I are the lover in this story. You and I are the scandalous person in this story. You and I are the sinner in this story. And excuse me for my language, but I have to, I have no other way to put it, but you and I are the prostitute in this story. I'm not saying it, it's the Bible that says it. We are the Gomer in this story. We are the lover in this story. We are the bride of Christ who has run away to become the lover of the world. Sad, sad story, but it's true. We are Gomer.
And to really understand the story, to really understand the love of God. All right, you won't, be, you won't understand God's love if you don't understand the context here. You are Gomer. Jesus is Hosea. Hosea is the same uh, Hebrew word for Jesus. Okay, Hosea is a prophetic picture of Jesus. You are Gomer. Jesus is Hosea. Okay, you're Gomer. Jesus is Hosea. Remember this context. Turn to your neighbor and say, I am Gomer. Other neighbor also, I am Gomer. Remember this context, okay? You're Gomer. Jesus is Hosea. And, and now let me take you inside the heart of God. I'm about to take you in the deep, deep place of God. And I want to show you what God's love really looks like. Christianity has tainted this picture. Has really, not mis, has really misinterpreted God's love. Has not shown the full picture of God's love. This is what God's love looks like. But you need the context. You're Gomer. You're Gomer. Jesus is Hosea. You ready? All right. Check this out. Check this out. Then the Lord said to me, Go and love your wife again. Go and love your wife again. Even though she commits adultery with another lover, go and love her again. This will illustrate that the Lord still loves Israel. Even though, even though the people have turned to other gods and love to worship the other gods, go and love your wife again. So, this is what Hosea did. So, I bought her back. I bought her back for 15 pieces of silver, five bushels of barley, and a measure of wine. Remember the context. You are Gomer. Jesus is Hosea, right? Now check out the ending, okay? Check out the climax. I'm going to just Role play this, all right? Excuse me for my non-romantic um, acting, but I'm, I'm trying to role play this, all right? Imagine Hosea now, the husband who's been cheated upon. Wives become a prostitute again. This husband going back into the brothel. Hosea is back at the brothel looking for his wife inside the brothel. He's asking men, have you, seen, have you seen this girl? Have you seen this girl? Showing them the photograph. Have you seen this girl? And guys are like, uh, uh, no, man, no. Uh, no, no. Uh, no, no, sorry, no. Looks simple. No, no. No, no. Oh, she looks kind of cute, but no. Not seen her. No, not seen her. And then one guy, one guy looks at it and, yeah, uh, actually, I, I was with her last night. She was with me last night. Uh, I don't know. I think tonight she's gone with another guy. I saw her going with someone else tonight. But what's the problem? Like, why are you asking this? I is everything okay? And then Hosea's like, um, actually, she's my, she's my wife. She's my wife. And this other guy is like, oh, so sorry, man. So, so, so sorry. Uh, I, I didn't know she was married. Sorry, uh, this might be really hard for you. This might be really, really tough for you, man. Um, so sorry. So what are you going to do? Uh, are you here to, like, hit her? Are you going to hit her? Are you going to, like, grab her by the hair and drag her out? Humiliate her? Are you going to spit on her? Are you going to beat her up? Are you going to kill her? going to kill her. Because hey, if my wife did something like that, I would kill her, man. I would kill her. Even though the law says to stone the woman who commits adultery to death, right? I would kill her. You have every right to kill her. So don't worry, I'm with you, bro. And Hosea looks at him and he's like, uh, no man, I'm, I'm actually come to, to take her back home. I'm taking her back home. And this other guy is like, what? You're taking her back home after what she did? She slept with me. 
Only I know what I did with her. Uh, after all of this, you're taking her back home with you. I'll wait for the ringtone to stop. But Gomer said, Hosea said, looked at her and said, uh, looked at the other guy and said, yeah, I'm going to take her home. I'm going to take her home because I still love her. And this guy's like, still, what if she does this again? What if she, she's a prostitute? What if, what if she does this again? And Hosea's like, then I'll come back again. Come back again. Because I love her. I love her, man. I love her. I cannot stop loving her. I cannot stop loving her. I won't leave her. I won't forsake her. I will love her till the end of time. I will love her. And so the scene, this is the scene. Gomer suddenly appears. The prostitute, the ex-wife, the wife, not divorced. She appears with the man who's just bought her for the night. Imagine the scene. She just appears and, and she's about to go into the room with this guy. And she, she looks and sees her husband in the brothel. Imagine the scene. Remember, Gomer is you. Imagine looking at the husband. And she's shocked. She's shocked. She doesn't know what to do. He's going to kill me. He's, he's going to kill me. I think he's going to punish me. He's going to beat me up. This is what you feel when you sin and, and you face God, right? This is what you feel. You're, he's going to kill me. He's going to punish me. He's going to finish me. And in that moment, Hosea approaches her and he's like, um, just come home. Just come home. I still love you. I still love you. Just come home. Just come home. And it, there is a scene created here. There is a moment created here. Right? Crowd gathers around them. There's a crowd because this does not happen in a brothel, right? Love does not happen in a brothel. And there's a crowd that's gathered. Uh, and this crowd is like talking about her, talking about the scene. They're all waiting because you know how it is in India, right? Something happens, everyone's got, especially in Goa, right? Everybody wants to stop their cars and see what's happening. So there's a crowd around them, all right? And this is the important part of this story. I want you to focus on this because this is the key of this story, this is the moment, and this moment, let me challenge you, is your life. This is exactly what happens in your life. Every moment of your life, you have this scene where there are three options for you to focus on. Three options. Number one, first option is the crowd around you, the crowd in the brothel, the people around you who are all talking about you. They're all saying things like, Man, she's, she's terrible. I can't believe she did that to him. Can you, can you imagine? She did that to him. She's so unworthy. She's a beep, 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 beep. Right? She's so unworthy. She does not deserve him at all. She's, so, she's such a sinner. So messed up. And that crowd represents religion. That is the religious voice. And if you focus on the religious voice, if you focus on the crowd, all you're going to hear is how messed up you are, how broken you are, how terrible you are, how sinful you are, how unworthy you are, how undeserving you are. That's all you're going to hear. And if you're hearing this today in your life, guess what? You're focused on the crowd. You're focused on that religious voice. You need to change your focus. But that's option one, the crowd. Option two is the lover behind you. The lover behind you. The other guy. And this other guy represents the pleasures of the world. That sin, that addiction, that issue, that, you, that bad habit that you keep on going back to. That brothel of your life. Because everybody in this room, everyone watching online, you have a brothel inside of you. You have a brothel hidden somewhere in your life. 
It's that something, that, that dirty place that you keep on going back to every time. That dirty place that takes you away from God, makes you focus away from God. There's a brothel inside of you. Some, some brothels look looks like drugs. Sometimes it looks like alcohol. Sometimes it looks like pornography. Sometimes it looks like jealousy. Sometimes it looks like gossip. Sometimes it looks like this place where you keep on feeling like you're the victim, right? All the time, whatever that is, you have a brothel in your life and you have an option either to focus on that. That's option two. And when you focus on that place, when you focus on sin, when you focus on the lover, this is what you're going to hear. Check this out. Familiar voice. It's going to tell you, it feels so good right now. Right? Feels so good. This moment feels so good. It's all about this moment. Let's live in this moment. Let's live for the moment. We've not seen tomorrow. We don't know what tomorrow looks like. So let's make the most of today. Let's make the most of this moment. Let's just feel this moment. It's all about this moment. Right? Have you heard that before? Don't miss the moment. Make the most out of the moment. That's the voice of sin. It's the voice of sin. The, the greatest deception of sin, the greatest deception is that sin will always get you to focus on the moment. But God will always get you to focus on eternity. That's the difference. That's how you know. Are you focused on the moment? Are you living for the moment or are you living for eternity? That's how you know. Is your life this momentary life or is your life an eternal, limitless life? Is your, are you focused on the, on the pleasure or are you focused on your purpose? That's the difference. That's the second place you can focus in life, on the lover. But there's a third place. Thank God there's a third place. And if you ask me today, I've come here today to tell you about this third place. To focus on your third option. And that is Jesus. That is Jesus in front of you. And if you focus on Jesus, all that you'll hear, all that you see is pure love. Pure love. Perfect love. Not cheap love. Not momentary love, not pleasurable love, but pure love. A love that will never leave you, a love that will never forsake you, a love that has come chasing down to the brothel of your life, a love that has come to call you back home, a love that never fails, an unending love, a reckless love, everlasting love, a limitless love who knows nothing but that it loves you. That's the love. And here's the beauty. When you focus on Jesus, when you focus on the love of Jesus, all the other voices, they drown out. You won't hear the voice of the accuser. You won't hear the other voice. You won't even hear the voice of the lover who has just bought you for the night. You won't hear that guy. He won't be saying things like, hey, but I paid for her for the night. Why? Because Jesus paid the price. Jesus paid him back, right? It says here, it says here in, in Hosea uh, 3 verse 2, so I bought her back. He's bought you back from everyone who you owe something to. So there's nothing, there's no debt anymore. There's no accusation anymore. There's no punishment anymore. You don't owe anyone anything because Jesus paid everyone that you owe anything to. He's taken care of everything. The choice is yours. This Valentine's Day, the choice is yours. You have an option to focus on one of these three things. And the choice is yours. Focus on the crowd, focus on the lover, or focus on Jesus. And the choice is yours. It's up to you. What will you choose? And here's the thing. Jesus has a purpose for this Valentine's Day. Right? He has a purpose. Jesus has a purpose for this Valentine's Day. 
Jesus has come here to turn the lover into a bride. That's his purpose. That's his purpose. Jesus has come to the brothel of your life to search for his bride. Jesus wants to turn the, this church that has been trying to flirt with him to a church that goes and lives with him. That's his purpose. He's turning lovers into brides. And he's standing there. He's standing at the brothel of your life today. And he's standing there with a gift. And his gift is not a rose. His gift is not a ring. His gift is not a card. His gift is his own life. He's standing there. And the question is, the question is, will the lover of the world become the bride of Christ? That's the question. Will the lover of the world become the bride of Christ? Because Jesus is waiting. That's the question. This Valentine's Day. We did all of this to ask you that question. And no love story becomes a love story without an answer. Right? It's time to respond. Jesus has just asked you a question. It's your turn now. Close your eyes. Bow your head.